Hi, Jonathan. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Victoria. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to pick your brains because you're the uh, artistic director of Experimenta and you've been immersed in the world of art and technology for a really long time. And at the moment, uh, in the wake of this pandemic that we've all experienced, we've all been exposed to a lot more screen time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting to acknowledge that artists have worked with technology for many, many decades now. And um, they've worked with electronic platforms in really creative ways. Um, and not only can they create art using technology, but they can also give us a new perspective on the technologies that are in our midst. And, um, you know, as I said, many decades right through from film and photography and analog technologies from those times through to digital technologies which have involved virtual reality, uh, augmented reality, uh, robotics, um, gaming, all kinds of things. So I wonder if you, we could start uh, with you making some comments about the relationship between art and technology, what your thoughts are on that. Well, as you've touched on, you know, they're complex, fruitful, um, and, you know, always evolving. Uh, and I think, well, media arts, as you know, um, emerged in the second half of the 20th century and was really driven by the palette of technologies um, that emerged with, you know, the digital revolution. And I really like the way the German media theorist, um, Siegfried Zielinski, um, wrote about um, the way you might define this, this, I guess, generation of engagement with um, technology um, that has sort of been talked about as being media arts. And he, taught, he wrote about this in a catalogue for this amazing exhibition that I saw at um, ZKM in Karlsruhe uh, in Germany, a place that uh, viewers that are listening to this, if they ever get a chance to go there, they should go to Karlsruhe. And it's the only reason to go to Karlsruhe, <laughs> probably. But anyway, it is an Great. amazing institution. <laughs> Uh, and they had an exhibition there that I saw in 2018 called 100 uh, Masterpieces with and through media. And it was really kind of trying to give that um, context for the advent of the, of the a creative explosion we saw with all the digital technologies um, that are at our fingertips now. Um, and he talked in the catalogue about how um, the process and tactics employed by artists driven um, by media can be seen in sort of two ways, either in either instrumental terms as art with media, so with, or more in terms of essence as art through media. And I really, it's kind of a, like a simple way of thinking about the broad uh, directions and, and, and as I said, processes that artists employ. Um, uh, with uh, technology um, and very much in the early days like in the 1990s when media arts first emerged and stuff I, I guess the focus tended from artists tended to be very much on the former as in the technology itself the remarkable capabilities of the technology or and imagining what that, those capabilities might deliver and as the sector has matured, um, and, and particularly as audiences have become more adept at negotiating the technologies, and the experiment has played a critical role in this, you know, having been around for now over 30 years. Um, I think what you started to see was that um, artists started to focus more on the concept rather than the, the technology itself being the, um, the concept. Uh, and that the, the technology has increasingly become a tool to express a whole range of different interesting ideas. So you, you see those two sort of broad focuses constantly into interplay. There are some works that are a mixture of the two. And, <clears throat> and certainly whenever you see a new sort of technology being taken up, I argue VR is one of those at the moment. It's very current. Um, it's become affordable. You know, that's, that's also a key component of when artists pick it, pick it up as a tool. Um, but you see with VR, at the moment, quite an instrumental approach. It's the whiz-bang. Mm. And, and I think, you know, what, what, what I'm looking forward to is when, when it actually really is about the idea. And I often find, you know, talking to artists, 
when they ask me about, well, I, asking them, well, why have you used that technology? How's it serving the central concept that you're trying to com you know, communicate? And that can sometimes get a little bit lost, I think, when, um, when you get the wow of the technology. So it, Yeah, it's true, isn't it? I mean, there's one artist that comes to mind is a, an artist, Australian artist called Joyce Hinterding. And I first worked with her back in 1993 at the Art Guild of New South Wales. And she mm. created this installation, which at the time she described as, as the viewer or the audience being able to listen to the sound of technology. And she used all kinds of wires and tin cans. I don't know how she did it. Yeah. And then over the years, and she's collaborated with her partner, David Haynes, they've, they've created a beautiful interactive environments and um, they've almost collaborated with the technology, if you like. So we did a show back in uh, 2012 called Sonic Spheres and they produced this wonderful immersive installation. Um, and you basically, as a visitor, moved your body and the video or the or the environment live environment that they created changed as you moved so you could actually feel like you were journeying through it yeah, so yeah. it is like a kind of um not only were you as a viewer collaborating with the immersive environment but the technology itself is much more than a tool isn't it it's a it's a collaborative um environment or a collaborative yeah no well it, it, it's really interesting you you use that word collaboration because that's one of the things that i've noticed coming more to the fore now it's sort of like this next step really where where artists are starting to talk about the tools as not simply tools but as collaborators and john mccormack um you know based in melbourne uh wonderful artist um started life as a you know computer uh, scientist and, and and then moved into arts practice and he talks a lot about the computer and a lot of these digital technologies as collaborators and um, and and in, and what's interesting also about that is that it starts to challenge our very notion of um, creativity because certainly one of the defining um, characteristics uh, people talk about the difference between computers and humans is that humans have are creative and computers can't be so when you start to talk about the computer becoming a collaborator and not a tool you're starting to shift the you know the boundaries around around that and um, and I think and there's a there's a lot of work internationally too in this space as well um, and and I, I think well he talks about how and you know we've seen this right through history that 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 new tools do change art practice, you know. And he talks about that the advent of all the digital technologies is going to fundamentally change arts practice, and we're seeing that played out. But I think that next step of where they become collaborators and challenge our very um, notions of creativity is potentially going to open up all, all sorts of new developments in arts practice, which is really exciting. Yes, because he's using artificial intelligence. So he'll set something up, but then the computer is determining the ways in which you see the unfolding of the imagery, the colour, the palette, the rhythm. Yeah. Um, and uh, he doesn't control that. It's the algorithm controlling it. That's right. And that's what he, he talks about, you know, the delight and the surprise of when he set up a system, but it surprises him. And so that makes him think differently about, you know, where he's going. So it's, so it's both in his process and also in some of the works that he, he does. We've got a fabulous piece of his um, that's in our current touring um, uh, experiment to make sense, uh, our current touring triennial, which is exactly that. He's creating this little um, uh, virtual ecosystem, but that is also engaging with the public that are viewing it because it's picking up on the colours that people are wearing, and that's and that and that's feeding into the system. So, I think we'll see some really interesting developments um, uh, uh, in this way of rethinking the role of technology is not simply a tool. Um, it's also, yeah, it's also um, an exploration of. Uh, space in a new way and the environment in new ways too. Um, I did a show many moons ago uh, 
first of all, it was called Space Odysseys mm. in 2001 at the Outdoor New South Wales and then Deep Space at ACME. And um, there was a wonderful work in it by the artist, the Australian artist, again, Lynette Walworth, called Hold, which is in the collection of ACME. And um, you just held on to a glass bowl and from above was projected all these images of underwater life, um, minutiae of uh, amoebas and cells and all sorts of things. And you felt like you were holding the universe in your hands, but you had a completely different relationship to the space and energy of the sea by her making it so intimate and holding it within a kind of domestic environment. And um, so I think the sort of spatial relationship we have with our environment, the ways we live, is completely changing through the impacts of technology as well. Yeah, and that work is, is one of my all-time favourite works. I think it's one of the masterpieces of Australian contemporary art, really. Um, and what I loved about that too is, yes, it completely changed the space, but also the way, you know, she thought about a different sort of interface, you know, because, and I think increasingly that's, a, uh, uh, um, I think, a really interesting pathway to explore because we're so used to screens and, and, um, and <laughs> maybe even with the COVID stuff even more so, so to have the interface there, which was those beautiful sandblasted glass bowls capturing the image as it was being projected, was a really different experience of, of, of interface design, if you like, to what you would, would typically see. So, yeah, I really encourage artists to think about that, you know, because, partly because screens have become so all-pervasive mm. um, that, that, it, that, it, that they're almost... Yeah, you know, in the way that, and partic particularly as screens have proliferated in public space, I think increasingly as humans, we actually switch off from them because it's too much noise, you know? So somewhat, so an artist to do, to, to think about interfaces in a more interesting way is immediately captivating, I think. And that work, you know, does that. Yes, and the other, the other take, I suppose, that some artists have is to use analog technologies to create a new work. So for instance, yeah. um, several years ago, we invited the artist James Hullock to do a response to the painter, mid-century painter Edwin Tanner, who um, emerged during the cybernetics boon. He was an engineer and he had a lot of paintings around technology and uh, the dehumanising qualities of technology, if you like. And James Hullock did an installation um, made up of all the sort of analog technologies and it was great and did performances with it. So um, you can always rely on these artists to do the opposite of the way that technology seems to be heading, <laughs> it seems. <laughs> it's a good thing. Um, yeah. But what, it, what, given that we're in the pandemic now and we're being asked to be physically distant from one another, what do you think some of the changes have been or have you noticed anything in recent weeks or heard anything that about artists or different ways of thinking about um, interactivity? Well, certainly from, I mean, I think um, I was listening to actually an interview with Billy Bragg, you know, the musician, the activist musician, and he was, he was um, recently, and he was talking about how social distancing is for him has been a bit of a misnomer because actually he's even though he's been socially isolating himself because um he talked about his partner having a, a compromised immune system so he's he's actually been you know holed up on his little cottage somewhere in the uk which is where he was doing the interview from um he said it is physical distancing, but his experience has been that he's been as socially connected, if not more so, you know, than he was previous to that time. Because I think in a way the pandemic reminded us all of how important it is to stay connected. And so, um, so he's been using all these tools um, in a way that, you know, during the era of the Spanish flu, I can't imagine how, you know, you would have really been isolated in your house or whatever, unable to talk to other people, whereas, you know, we're in a privileged position where we can. Um, look, I think time will tell. Uh, um, there are artists that are working already in, in responses to it. I think from our point of view, um, 
we're, you know, in the final stages of preparation for uh, the launch of our next uh, triennial, which will open in Melbourne at the end of the year. And, um, and of course, one of the hallmarks of media arts practice is interactivity. And so we're having a lot of discussions internally about how we're going to handle this, because of course there are a number of works that we have selected for the show that are hands-on works. So we're, yeah, we, we haven't come up with it. We're just going to have to think of some creative solutions to that. That's, that, that's, going to, that's going to be a really different way of coming into the exhibition space where you have to be much more careful about the hands-on sort of interactivity. And I have to say, we've already, taken a, a work off the list for consideration and a VR work because we actually, from a very practical point of view, we realised that the kind of maintenance of that work for the public um, over the duration of the three year tour uh, was going to be too much for many galleries. You know, they don't have the human resources to be able to deliver that. So, so that's a very real impact you know, straight away in terms of the selection of work um, that we're, we're thinking about. And, um, uh, and there will be no doubt others that you will see in the exhibition later yeah. this year. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. I, I saw the South Bay show at the Serpentine Gallery in London just before it got shut down and they had two VR pieces and um, they, it was in a separate room with a closed door um, all the VR material was like cleaned down and disinfected between each person. I mean, very labor intensive. And, you know, as your show tours around small to medium sized regional galleries across the country, you know, as you say, they're not able, they don't have the staff to be able to do that, which is a great pity. I have, I have another question for you, which is, I mean, how do you curate exhibitions of media art? Do you think you need to ask questions of the works uh, in a different way from a curator who works with non-media art, for instance? Yeah, well, I mean, that was the fundamental shift that happened with the advent of media art in terms of the way that you have to think about the, the, the space. It's not just about the play of ideas between different works, but because you're dealing with, well, interactivity, but also... Um, sound and light are really significant aspects of media artwork. Um, and um, so you need to think about how they play through the space too, so that because you, there's, there's always a risk that um, any of those elements could actually interfere and undermine um, the experience of engaging with another work in the space. So, you know, the ideal exhibition space for a media art show would be that there would be an individual room for each, you know, piece. But clearly the infrastructure that we work with was largely built before media arts even existed. Um, and so when, you know, we're working with spaces that were set up essentially for painting shows and, um, and, and sculptural shows or a mixture of those two things. So, so we have to, you know, it, it, in terms of our process um, that I work with my curators, we actually go through, um, walk through the exhibition space with each of those elements in our heads, if that makes sense. So we think about the sound walk, the light walk, the interactivity, because you also don't want to, you don't want to have too much interactivity in one particular area because then that'll, that'll slow the movement of audiences through the space and you'll create bottlenecks. So it's, you've got to, yeah, you've got to construct a much more complex journey really mm. to, to, to a conventional um, uh, exhibition. So Jonathan, you've um, done a number of commissions uh, for the next Experimenter exhibition. Can you, um, are you allowed to, you know, reveal anything? Can you talk through uh, one of the commissions that we might see at the end of the year? Yeah, well, look, uh, um, there's, um, uh, we've got a range of commission works. Um, and, of course, they're all in process at the moment. So, you know, um, I'm just trying to think if any of them are completely finished. I don't know that they are. But, look, I'll talk about uh, one of them, Helen Pointer. Um, who uh, is an amazing Australian artist um, and a lot of her practice um, sits in that sort of art science space. 
Um, and um, she, the inspiration for her work was um, she recently had a hip replacement. Um, and for those people that are familiar with her work, you, you'll know that she's, she's re very interested in those sort of the, the blurry edges of transition zones, often between life and death, you know, is one of the areas that she's very interested in. In this particular piece, um, because the exhibition title is Experimental Life Forms, so we're looking at um, notions of life um, in the 21st century. Um, and um, and she, she was very interested in, um, if you like, the agency of other parts of the body, because we often think of our life as being really in our head. And she And she's also picking up in this piece about the increasing um, integration of uh, biological material and non-biological material in the human body. So she's used CT scans, of course. You know, there's there's a whole body of a number of artists who are working with a lot of the kind of imaging technique te technologies that you will see in in um, the medical field, and she's definitely one of those artists that uses that in really creative ways. Um, and so it will be an installation that will involve a, a range of scans and also um, uh, she was able to, and this is not an easy task, um, um, get the uh, bone that was exercised from her body and she's going to work that, she's grind, ground that down to create a piece of bone china. <laughs> <laughs> which will be a sculptural piece in the work. So it, it's going to be an extraordinary investigation about where we are with advances in medical sciences and what that might um, mean in terms of our understanding of life as we know it. That sounds fascinating. And, and you know, one can't forget the very pioneering work of Stellark in this, in this field Absolutely. where he um, extended the human body, created prostheses for the human body, in terms of the third arm and, and the extra ear, et cetera. And then Patricia Piccinini, who many of the Tarawara viewers will know, um, has always been interested in the relationship between the scientific body and the intimate body and uh, how we decide what's ethical and what isn't ethical in terms of the kinds of uh, animal parts that, that many people have in their bodies today, like the, um, the heart valve made from a pig, for example. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the exciting, the exciting thing about artists working with technology now is that they really do ask us to think about some of these big questions about uh, the intervention in the body, the ethics of uh, science and medical research and collaboration. And, you know, we can take it, take it back to that in the end because many of these electronic media artists are working in collaborative fields, whether it's uh, with scientists or botanists or... Um, technologists, uh, all kinds of fields, uh, design, architecture, all kinds of fields are opened up by these artists in order to express themselves. I wonder, you know, after COVID, um, and hopefully there is post-COVID, um, you know, whether artists will be uh, pursuing ideas of intimacy, touch and connection even more, uh, given that we've been held apart, as it were, um, by this current pandemic. Um, it's just something to perhaps finish on, Jonathan. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, can I just, I just want to add to what you were talking about because we need to mention Symbiotica as well, you know, yes. in terms of that space. Yes. Um, and I think what's lovely about you talking about Stellark and Patricia and we're talking about Helen is, is we're now, there's a lineage, you know, there's a history to this work so that the, the next generation that's coming through has got this incredible um, lineage of Australian artists doing amazing work and continuing to do so. Um, and I just think it's important to, you know, uh, talk, uh, remind people of that. Mm. Um, but yes, I, th I think, um, I reckon there will be really interesting things around intimacy, you know, that come out of this because in a way, um, these technologies can be both intimate and not. So I think there's, you know, to some extent people have, uh, like I touched on earlier, I've, I've felt in some ways more connected to people through this period because I've been much more conscious of the need to do it. Hmm. Um, and I think um, 
I think the other thing for us is we couldn't have picked a better time to do the theme experimental life forms mm -hmm. when we have a virulent virus life form running around the planet creating havoc. So, um, so I think through the journey of the exhibition, a lot of those things that you touched on, we'll, we'll, we'll see as audience renegotiate the gallery space, we renegotiate what we can do in the gallery space. I don't know all the answers to that yet, um, but we will be finding out very soon. Yeah, time will tell. I will tell. Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a um, very interesting time that we're all going through and uh, we really value your insights into it. So thanks again. And thanks for speaking. Yeah, it's great to talk. You too. See ya.